So competitors, right? People think that yeah. Waymo and Cruise are way ahead. Uh, we've seen videos from China. Actually, I have not done my own research on the Chinese yeah. uh, progress, but some people are saying, oh, they're mm -hmm. so far ahead too. They've got authority yeah. from the government. The good news, by the way, is that every single country seems to be, Europe is fast tracking FSD beta usage in Europe. Um, every mm -hmm. country seems to have, uh, they're gonna start expanding it to other countries. Now we're seeing them yeah. test the hiring uh, ADAS people to test out FSD beta there. And then other countries are now approving or headed towards approving FSD beta being tested there. But so, the, the, you know what I mean? Like, I guess my, my point, yeah. We should actually spend a little bit of time talking about this because Definitely. a few years ago, everybody said, oh yeah, maybe the tech will get there, but there's no way the cities and the regulators will ever approve this. It's going to mm -hmm. take them years. But in fact, the opposite has happened. It yeah. seems like they're all just jumping the gun, like ju maybe even jumping the gun, but they're actually approving it and they're creating committees and they're actually promoting mm -hmm. this to happen. Um, let's talk about that before we get to competitors. Yeah. Tell me what you're thinking about that, if I'm right. I guess, yeah, on, on that, you know, because we, we think that robo taxis will be beneficial for the economy, they'll be beneficial for cities because they'll prevent accidents. I mean, we see like with cell phones and distracted driving um, uh, accidents today versus five years ago. I mean, it's just not a very pretty picture. And I, I think it's like in the city's best interest to get it passed. That said, I mean, there's always there's always going to be pushback. We see that happening right now in San Francisco, cruise Waymo vehicles um, at emergency. Well, the, the claim is that they're not behaving yeah. as they should at like emergency response scenes. So it's not perfect, but let's give credit where credit's due. Um, Waymo was first to get a commercial service, albeit in a very limited area in Chandler, Arizona. I think they're watching, they're likely now watching what Cruise is doing and wanting to move even faster because I think um, Cruise, uh, you know, they've expanded service to all of San Francisco. Um, you know, they, 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 they are, they're launching in Austin. They, they said that they would, I think if you look at the time period from when it took them to launch in San Francisco, it was something like, I don't know, a number of years and then 90 days to launch in Austin where they didn't have, um, mm -hmm. any service before. So I think that's pretty impressive. I, I like that they're moving away from HD maps too, by the way, of course, that's like more similar to what, um, Tesla has been saying for a while. And, uh, certainly seems to make sense. Like maybe you want a more generalizable approach as you're expanding uh, service and maybe, you know, whatever you've learned in um, San Francisco has given them confidence to do so. I think the difference between Tesla, the main difference between Tesla competitors, as I said, is the data advantage. Um, so Cruise and Waymo, Cruise has 2 million miles in the cumulative lifetime of the project. It might be more than that at this point, but I think that's the last uh, announced data point that they gave. Waymo, and that's that's driverless miles. That's what they count. Waymo um, has uh, they call it public rider only miles. So it's not quite apples to apples, but close enough. That I think they've announced a million mile marker so far. And then again, two hundred fifty million miles Tesla FSD beta. Is it totally apples to apples? No. Um, I mean, you still have a driver behind the wheel, but I think it just gives you an idea of the scale and the data difference between those companies. And of course, the big difference is Tesla's doing it vision only, where these companies are using LiDAR and HD maps. Um, I think that the HD map approach has proven itself to be first to market. And now it's a question of, well, who's first to scale? Um, and I, I think that the, the vision only approach, tests, which, you know, in, in a lot of ways, Tesla actually had to do um, to, you know, get uh, the right hardware on, on uh, consumer cars on the road. But, you know, that's that's how they're going to get the scale, get the data advantage to solve this on like a, a more generalizable scale where maybe they could launch faster in other cities um, than competitors have done so far. If you look at what's happening in the U.S. versus the rest of the world, you know, I'm actually surprised at the way that robo taxis have panned out in, in the U.S. And it's, it's almost like an accident that the decisions were made at local levels because there was no federal authority uh, or, you know, in terms of like driving on public roads, you have to get approved state to state and you have to work with local cities as opposed to this like blanket approval over the country. And that actually ended up being a good thing because then states competed with each other to get these tech companies to come in and, and test their vehicles and, you know, bring engineering talent into the city. In China, I think that things can happen. Like, let's not kid ourselves. Things happen at China like speed. We, we've seen that with mm -hmm. Tesla's factories even. So it's like there was always the opportunity that, oh, it actually could be. And it maybe it still will be at, at like a larger scale first there. But 
I've actually, as I've watched the regulatory progress there, I'm less convinced that that'll happen now. Um, I still think the U.S. will likely be first. And that's really because uh, the companies themselves move at amazing uh, speed. But uh, the government has restricted testing to like specific business zones and cities. And so it's not the same type of approval that you would get if you're approved to drive an autonomous vehicle in California. You could go anywhere within the state. It would be a smaller part of the city. And then you're not going to get the diversity in the data set to solve the problem as well, I think. Um, so, you know, Baidu is working on it there. Pony AI, private company. Uh, we Ride, another private company. Baidu, I think, has the most, uh, like, they have, they are driving in over 10 cities with autonomous vehicles. So like in terms of scale and uh, regulatory approval favor with local authorities, they seem to be winning that game. But it's a question of whether or not they have the best technology that might be with one of the private players. So I think maybe, you know, US first, China second here, and then Europe probably last. Um, and it's really, again, because the way that approval has rolled out, uh, you know, you just want to be able to test on open public roads. Um, and the way that I've seen it work so far has just been limited to specific swaths of highways, things like that. I, I think that once scale picks up here, then, then other countries will say, hey, what are we doing? We have to get this on our own roads. Um, so I think it'll happen. It just might not be as quick. I love this. That was a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Long answer. Okay. No, no, I prefer that. Thank you, Tasha. But so, so many questions I've got right now. So, first is, do you believe that there's truth to this concept that people are saying that NHTSA, regulatory Mm -hmm. body for you know driving here in um, in motor vehicles here in the U.S., that if they had seen FSD beta being used as uh, human supervised driving? causing any issues, like significant uh, you know, issues to be concerned about, they would have shut it down. They would have said anything. The fact that they've been quiet, is that kind of like, yeah, you can't really read too much into that? Or is that there's some truth that maybe it is true that Tesla has released data to show that uh, autopilot is nine times safer than human drivers alone. So human driver, human supervised F, uh, autopilot is nine times safer and human supervised FSD beta is six times safer than a human driver. If that is true, which this is, you know, I don't imagine Tesla would ever say anything that isn't, then of course NHTSA would approve of this and they would support this improvement. Do you think there's some truth to that? I do think that Tesla is working closely with NHTSA. I mean, they've they've said that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we we know that to be true, that they're at least in conversation and they strive to be in conversation with them, which which is smart. Um, I, I have a lot, I have a lot of thoughts on this. So first I think to your point, Tesla gets so much scrutiny. And the, you know, the big traditional automakers have a lot of like lobbyist power that I think if there was something wrong, um, yeah, even if it was like borderline wrong, I think it would be shut down or at least like we'd see, you know, some investigation where it had to be paused. Uh, So I I do agree with that um, point of view. I will say like back to this data advantage that I keep on harping on, Tesla is actually in a much better position with regulators as well. Because if you think, oh, you want to statistically yeah. prove that you're better than a human and you only yeah. have a million miles, I mean, it's like, is that at more than the average person? The average person drives something like 10,000 miles a year. Yeah, but you know, you, you want to prove like to whatever ninth of accuracy you, you want to slide in here that you're statistically better. So I, I think that they're really well set up there. Um, yeah. And I've actually done some analysis myself looking at the data, data uh, Tesla released on FSD autopilot and then, uh, you know, compared to the national average of accidents. And I think, I think it's at least like five, like maybe five or six times safer than a re- than just a human driving a Tesla vehicle if you're driving an FSD already. So I, I expect that they're sharing that with regulators. And, um, you know, is that a perfect statistic? No, but none of these statistics are perfect, right? I've seen like a lot of, you know, critiques of, oh, what are they counting versus others? But I, I think that they're trying to make it as close to what is actually considered an accident and the national statistics as they possibly can. So um, that's that's my take. Okay. And then back to competitors. Uh, there are yeah. people who think that, uh, yeah, you've got all these competitors, you walked us through them. We all are keep hearing about Cruise and Waymo and the Chinese companies. And some people go, yeah, they're just, they'll catch up. They're doing it too. So this is at the end of the day going to be a wash. Uh, but then you also yeah. are saying that there's a data advantage. So yeah. what, you know, I keep telling people, if you believe that in order to do robotaxi, you must have the three things that Elon said, right? You'd have to have a supercomputer, 
you have to have billions of miles driven and you have to have the neural nets and the engineers to do this. If you don't have all three, you're not going to solve this problem. And yet they point to these other companies and say they're doing it and they've got geofence and they'll scale it. Do you see the world as one take all or is it going to be multiple competitors and everybody has a piece of the pie? I think it'll be winner takes most, maybe in specific geographies. Um, so I think, and when I say that, I mean, like, I don't know, maybe North America is a geography, uh, maybe in areas of Europe, it's more pocketed, um, could be country to country, you know, in China, maybe it's even regional, depending on like how the regulatory situation shakes out there. But um, okay, so like, what is all of this for? Why do we care about robo taxis at all? Well, I think that the lower the cost per mile of personal point to point transport, right now, Uber's average price is like, you know, two to $3 per mile, let's say, uh, you know, as high as four plus, of course, but I think that at scale, my modeling suggests that a robo taxi could be as cheap as 25 cents a mile to the consumer. I think that there's a lot of room in between $3 and 25 cents for uh, pricing that'll be amenable to consumers. So I don't think it has to be that low. And I don't think it will be that low um, upon initial release. Really, all you need to do is to undercut today's ride hill prices. Um, and you do that, you know, both by taking the driver out, but, but also I think that these cars might have better utilization rates uh, than both today's taxis and of course, personal cars. So it could actually be cheaper than you if you live in a city, it'll be cheaper to take a robo taxi than it will be to drive your personal car because that costs you roughly like 70 cents on average per mile in the US um, to drive a new personal car, at least uh, a little bit less for the average vehicle. So that said, you get this data advantage, you launch, you get to scale first, you're able to undercut your competitors on pricing, competitors even being ride hill platforms at this point. Then I think it's really hard for the second company to catch up. Because you're likely, you know, whoever crossed the finish line at scale first ha probably has some technology advantage over you. So you're like trying to catch up on the technology front, which probably isn't cheap to do, while also kind of trying to stay competitive on price. We've seen like in the ride hill wars that can get pretty ugly. Um, and, you know, it's like it's similar to what we're seeing to some extent happen in the electric vehicle market. Not every automaker is producing them profitably. Um, I think it'll be hard to do to compete profitably with a company that gets to scale first. 